Hi everyone, welcome to Mama Wears Athleisure. I am your host, Mariella de Santiago, a first time mom. We focus on all things mom with tips to help make life easier and more organized for all you mamas out there. Hi everyone, today I'm here with Janet from Relaxed San Diego Magazine, and we're going to talk a little bit about calming strategies for kids. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me and for the intro. Mariela said, I'm Janet Gilbert, editor for Relax San Diego Magazine. So our mission at Relax San Diego is to be practical and inspirational guide to all the most relaxing parts of our city. And as a mom with small kiddos at home, I wanted to kind of gather tips for those relaxing experiences, memorable outings, wellness, and calm home environments. And being a school counselor, um, I love to talk about how coping skills can help foster that calm home environment. So it all kind of ties in together. Thank you for all that. So you make very valid points. We do live in a great city where we're surrounded by lots of nature to help us relax. Yeah, when it comes to calming strategies for kids, I know that there's a lot of things that we can do for kids that are very young, but I want to get a little bit of your thoughts on why are coping skills important for littles, regardless of age? And when do you think it would be good to start? start some of these? Well, first, just kind of like the importance behind it. So the world is a big, big place. And we've all just kind of been through this with COVID, this collective kind of trauma together. And we're just kind of exposed to these unending changes day in and day out. We don't know what's coming. But in addition to that, there's also some particular challenges that come with being a kid and being a little, they're all kind of just their brains are forming, they're learning and growing. So if as adults, we find ourselves getting kind of overwhelmed or overcome with our emotions, no wonder that our kiddos kind of get overpowered at times by these big, big feelings. I say big feelings a lot. That's what I use with the kids. (laughs) Um, But as caregivers, we want to give them the best tools to manage those big feelings. And we want to help teach them to be their own problem solvers and build up what I like to call it our um, coping skills toolbox. These coping skills toolboxes just kind of really set them up for success as they move about their day. Um, But you kind of were talking about ages of kiddos. And so probably formally too is when we can kind of push in with those like formal coping skills and really using curriculums and things. There's so many cool calming techniques you can find online. But one thing that we don't realize is that even before they're two, we're modeling these things for them every single day. Stuff that you probably already do and you just do it naturally and you don't even notice. So like an example is, let's say you're at a noisy restaurant or a family gathering and you notice your kiddo's getting fussy or your baby's getting fussy. Naturally, you probably take a step outside, right? And in doing that, you're probably taking a breath, getting some fresh air and kind of modeling for them like, hey, if this is a little too much, we're going to hop outside and take a minute for ourselves and kind of like reset and recharge. Or even the things that we do with our babies from day one, we're rocking, we're swaying, we might have nature sounds or white noise or all these calming things. And eventually they're kind of just like taking it all in and they're noticing what we're modeling for them. And every kid is different. I say, I said two, but I mean, every kid is kind of at a different space with that. And I think one of the first things we can do with the young kiddos with coping skills is talking about noticing our emotions and naming them. And that can all start really, really young. I love that you mentioned all of that. My son is one, he just turned one. And I'm a big believer that I feel like kids pick up on our energy. And so anytime he is having a hard time or he's frustrated or whatever it may be, I try to pick him up and model that deep breath in Mm -hmm. and out, even though he can't do it yet. But I'm hoping that somehow feeling that and eventually is able to use that as a skill as he's older. Mm -hmm. Yes, the uh, modeling. I love that you also mentioned that because I try to do a lot of those things. And my background is also in special ed. So a lot of the calming and the behavior skills and working with their feelings. So it's really interesting to know that you can do a lot of this now and that there are also on top of that so many books out there that talk about this, which I feel Mm -hmm. like maybe wasn't so talked about previously when we were growing up. (laughs) 
I know I always say that I'm always like, man, I wish that I had like, cause I'm a school counselor and I do these like small groups where we do kindergarten coping skills and all this. And I'm like, oh, I wish in kindergarten, I was learning this. I feel like I would have been set up for more success in life, but I don't think, yeah, it really wasn't a big focus. We didn't have as many school counselors. There weren't as many books out there. We weren't really like talking about it like we do now. So we're making good good progress, I think, in this area. I know you kind of already talked about this a little, but how can parents help teach some calming strategies to kids as they are at the age of being able to kind of comprehend and use those skills? Every kiddo is different. And there are so many calming strategies. I know it's I, when I think of it, I think of breathing or taking a walk outside, but there are thousands and thousands and we don't even realize sometimes that we're doing these things every day that really are good coping skills. So that's why it's really important. What parents can be doing right now is practicing some of these strategies with their kiddos to figure out which ones work best. So it's a great idea to do this practice when kids are calm, right? So when it pops up for me is when my kids like having a meltdown and I'm like, okay, like, you know, use your breathing. We're going to try this. And that's great. But a lot of times when they're in that mode, their amygdala is flipped. And so they're not in their thinking brain, they're in their emotional brain, right? So some of the best times to practice are when they're in this calm state before a big meltdown, right? So that they can kind of take in the information, practice, and then it becomes like, you know, more of an autopilot for them, or maybe not autopilot, but you know, it's something that's familiar. And so building these strategies into your day is a good way to start. So I like to do part of our nighttime routine because that's the time where I know my kiddos feel the most calm or winding down. I ask my kindergartner questions all day long and he gives me nothing. But for some reason, when it's bedtime, it's like, besides like, I want water, I want a snack. He'll, he gives me like the keys to the kingdom, <laughs> you know, at bedtime. So for us, that's a really great time to build in our feelings check. How are you feeling today? you know, anything you want to problem solve, like how did your day go? And so it's just a nice time. You know, he might share something that happened at school or even my three-year-old, like will share something that happened at school. And I'll be like, well, how did that make you feel? You know, when that happened? Oh, okay. All right. You were feeling frustrated. Like what did you do to help your body feel calm? So just kind of building it into our day as we can, maybe even at dinner time. And this just teaches our kids that it's okay to have big feelings. Our feelings are valid, right? So we can have those big feelings, but it's what we do when we have them. That's super important. And it's giving them that safe space to share. So you're kind of allowing them to like have that moment to be like, hey, we all have feelings. Like this is normal. We go through the day and, and this is just kind of how it is. And what can we do to help ourselves feel more calm when those big waves are kind of coming at us? And then the other thing too is back to that modeling showing them, you know, even for ourselves, like, you know, mommy's feeling really frustrated right now. Like I'm going to take a beauty breath. Do you want to do it with me? Or I'm going to take a minute to go outside because I'm feeling a little bit frustrated. So showing them that we also have those feelings and that humans have those feelings and we can work through them together. And I feel like at the same time, kids are teaching us how to use these coping skills that maybe mm -hmm. we didn't before. No, definitely. I, I more than once, I'm, I'm not going to lie, more than once, I've had my son go, Mommy, maybe you need to take a deep breath. And in the moment, I'm like, <laughs> Oh, he's right. But then I'm so happy in the end because I'm like, Yay, it's Stinky again. And he knows, and we're all helping each other. Yeah, I definitely feel like I, I've used a lot more skills to kind of manage my feelings of feeling overwhelmed now that I have a little one because I don't want to show how frustrated I can get if there's a lot going on. I have to, you know, try to think about he's picking up on everything that I'm doing right now. They don't have any language skills. So a lot of his other intuitions are probably a little bit stronger and, mm -hmm. you know, just modeling a lot of what I would hope to see him do as he gets older. I know I have mm -hmm. to try to do that. We're all just doing our best. It's okay to feel mad or frustrated sometimes. Kids are going to see that and they see you doing these awesome things to work through it. And it's just such a good learning, teachable moment. I love that you're doing that. In uh, the mom group that I'm hosting, we're doing a monthly book talk. So a lot of the books that we are reading tend to be on the feelings and how to help kids work through them. And one thing that you had said was labeling them, like labeling mm -hmm. the feeling of frustration or sadness or feeling upset and letting them know that it's okay to feel that way and working mm -hmm. through them rather than 
kind of getting them to shut down. Validating. <laughs> yes. We all need to feel validated too. It's so nice. Sometimes that's all it takes. Like sometimes just feelings identification, naming that feeling is like, oh, okay. Like they get it. And like, sometimes that's enough. Not always, but. <laughs> I know you mentioned a few of these already, but what are some easy techniques that parents could begin to implement right away that they can find helpful regardless of age? Anything that a parent listening right now could start to try to do today? Like you said, the first step I think is the noticing the feelings, but from there, where do we feel our feelings in our bodies? And kids can kind of start learning this at a really, really young age. I just give them examples like when you're, when you start to get really mad and you're angry, does your face get hot? Do you clench your fists? Or like, if you're feeling worried about something, do you feel it in your tummy? You know, things like that, where I'm just kind of giving them some suggestions. And it's funny because I can only come up with so many. I'm like, I don't know, face gets hot, this and that. And when I do this with kids, like a lot of them just know, you know, and they'll say all these things. I'm like, oh, I didn't even think of that. You know, everyone's so different. But as soon as they can notice those body cues, it's super helpful because then they can identify, when, okay, I'm about to have a big feeling. Then they can kind of push in with some of those coping strategies before they get into meltdown mode. So a quick, easy way that I like to teach this, the feelings in the body is I just get a body outline. Like you can find one online and print it out. And I have kids color where they feel their feelings. So like older kids, they might use pictures. They might draw butterflies in their stomach or whatever. But even the younger kids, either I'll give them like a little color code or just have them color like, okay, well, when you're really feeling really worried, where do you feel that? And so it's just kind of a nice way to help them tap into that. Once you kind of do the feelings in the body, that's when we do coping skills toolboxes. I think this is a pretty easy thing to implement at home because it can kind of be, you know, whatever your kiddo needs, it can be big, it can be small, but I love to make calm corners. When I was in a school, I did a calm kit for every single classroom. And then I made mini calm kits to go during COVID. And so just there's so much science and so much research on how powerful these spaces can be. The key thing for a calm corner, I think any good calm corner, you want to have maybe like a feelings identification printout. So they can work on the feelings identification and maybe even a timer, if you can, like a little sand timer, something visual. And the kid, they, they're, if they're having a tough time, they would go to the calm corner, right? Choose their feeling, flip their timer and practice some of these coping skills. I'm going to share articles soon with some of my favorite calm corner items. But I think the main idea is that it's filled with uh, your kiddo's preferred calming strategies. So it might be like meaningful family photo, a stuffy they love, a box of fidgets, visuals for like breathing or coping skills. And the same thing, like it's important with this calm corner. It can be little, it can be big, but it's super important that they practice it when they're feeling calm. They need to know it's not a punishment. It's not like, go to the calm corner, you're in timeout, you're in trouble. So my son, when he was really, really little, I would just say something to him like, wow, it looks like you're feeling really mad or really frustrated. Like, do you wanna take some time in the calm corner with your stuffy? So that kind of worked for us. And now by the time I'd say he was four was when he started self-identifying and he started saying, oh, I'm, mad. I'm going to the calm corner, you know? It was exciting to see that work in my own home because I like feel like I coach parents on it all the time and to see it actually like come to life is great. And we switch out the stuff. He'll try out some things. Some things are working. Some things are not working that month or day. And we kind of just keep a little rotation system going. But he has a few things that kind of always work for him. And we just keep him in a little beanbag corner in his room. And so I think that's something pretty simple that parents can start right now with things they kind of already have. My daughter's three, but she's had her little calming space since she was like, maybe like one and a half or two. And I would just include little sensory items and we would do the things together and watch the sand timer, things like that at like a really young age. I'm definitely going to start creating one of those for my son. <laughs> but you mentioned yeah. a really important part that I guess I would have never even thought of, but while you're labeling where they feel their feelings, you're also teaching them that mindfulness. So it's really nice to know that's something you can start now mm -hmm. so that it becomes a habit for them as they grow up. My favorite thing to say for mindfulness is telling kids, you have to be where your feet are. 
because sometimes when we have these worries or we're afraid of something, we're living like too much. Our monkey mind is going in our brain. All these words are swirling around. So kind of just helping them. On Relax San Diego, I posted recently, I love to post grounding strategies. So there's like all different ways you can do it. But one of my favorite is the rainbow grounding strategies because a lot of kids know their rainbow colors or you can do it for them. Well, and it helps kind of as a bonus, you're teaching them colors, but it's like, see, look around the room, see one thing that's green. Okay. Did you find it? Okay, cool. Now look around the room and look for one thing that's red. So it kind of just like gets them out of this, like the monkey mind and all those thoughts swirling around and back into the moment. So I always have a rainbow grounding in my palm corner at home. I love all of these tools that you're giving me as an adult. (laughs) Yeah, me too. You have some articles on your website. So I'll definitely have those linked onto the show notes so people can refer to those. Do you have any other tips, suggestions, or recommendations? As a parent, you're listening to this podcast. You're already doing such great things for your kiddo every single day. And there's a lot of pressure as parents, right? To like get it right or be perfect, but we're all human. And the process of having feelings is human. So you're doing a great job. And being the calm in our kiddo storm is super important, but it's just one of the hardest things to do, right? Because when they're babies, we have this psychological or even physiological sometimes response, right? When our baby cries, it's hard because we want to like help them meet their needs and we want to fix it for them. And as they're getting older and moving about the world, we want to teach them to kind of be their own problem solvers and remain calm. And so working on some of these coping skills together is really great. And even as adults, we need coping skills as well. And so I don't know about you guys, but for me, I always think like, oh, a spa day or self-care. And it's great if you can swing it. Awesome. But there's so many things that we can do as parents to take care of ourselves that don't cost a ton of money. You know, we can do our the grounding, our breathing skills, take a warm bath, walk away if we're feeling upset, have a drink of water. It's important to take care of ourselves too, because we're doing a lot and we're taking on a lot of the emotions of our littles at the same time. You guys are killing it. You're doing great things. And also, I don't know if you have a business, like your own small business or one that you think is really great and you want to be featured, send me a message because we love to support small businesses in the area. So that's just my little plug. And your info will be linked in the show notes. So if anyone that is in San Diego would like to be featured in Relax San Diego, check out the show notes. What I was also going to say is, yes, very, very good points on the self-care. Super important. Finding just a little bit of time to do something that helps you as a parent to feel like you're giving yourself something is really important. You know, I see this a lot where like some people will say taking a shower is self-care and some people are like taking a shower is not (laughs) self-care. I don't think it's (laughs) self-care. Yeah. It's like a basic need, right? (laughs) It's Yeah. It's like brushing your teeth. (laughs) Um, taking a bath, that's Mm -hmm. self-care, but Mm -hmm. there's so many things that you could do that you could just do at home while baby is napping, even taking a nap Mm -hmm. while the baby is napping. So Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you so much. I loved chatting with you. I love being able to learn about all of these calming strategies and I'm definitely going to get started on them now that I have a toddler now. So crazy. Got them so fast. So fast. And now, you know, he is definitely showing a lot more emotion and feelings and I want to be able to teach him that it's okay to have those but we just have to learn how to manage them, especially with limited communication. Those toddler years, <laughs> they're the best, all the stages, right? They're the yes. best, but you know, it's hard. So self-care, right? <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's definitely hard when uh, like last night, for example, all he wanted was me. So after he got out of the bath, I couldn't even put his jammies on. All he wanted was to be held by me. And I just remind myself like, you know, I'm happy that this is where we're at because later on when he's a stinky 13 year old boy, he's not going to mm-hmm. want mom. <laughs> You know, he's going to probably shut the door on me and say, mom, leave me alone. So I have to embrace these moments when he just wants to be held. The short, what is it, that phrase? The years are short and the, <laughs> I don't know. But is it the years are short, but the, the days, days are, are long? long? Yeah, days are <laughs> long, but the years are short. It's so true. And then I, I think about the 13-year-old boy scenario and I'm like, oh, again, self-care. <laughs> we just have to <laughs> take care of ourselves along the way, find these relaxing, you know, moments and, and little niches we can carve out into our lives to kind of work through it all because it's such a beautiful time. Thank you for having me and thank you for what you're doing for parents. These podcasts are amazing and so, so helpful. So thank you. Thank you for listening. 
Tune in next week for our next episode. You can find us on Instagram for more updates and tips. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a review if you like us.